We think that over the past 15 years, you, social entrepreneurs, armed with the tools of the private sector, and endowed with a sense of purpose, I brought creativity, soul, and grit to the world's most intractable issues. Social enterprise has reduced the rates of blindness in India, transformed women into entrepreneurs all around the world, and improved youth literacy in the United States. However, despite the success of social enterprise, the sector must reflect and innovate to move forward in the next 15 years. To do so, we believe that social enterprise should reflect four cardinal concepts. First, Social enterprise should simultaneously pursue purpose and financial sustainability. While there is a range of what today may fall under the term social enterprise, we believe that social enterprise should not just be a veneer for well-meaning but superficial corporate social responsibility initiatives, greenwashing, so to speak. Rather, we believe that companies should embed a social mission into the core of their business model. Social mission is not an afterthought for the social enterprise; it is the very ethos of the company. But we wonder. Do we write a firm definition for social enterprise? Do we even need one? <laughs> what benefit or harm does such a boundary create? What, what about nonprofits or social benefit corporations or public private partnerships? What fits under the umbrella? Which is all of a uh, more relevant question considering the weather today. Second, social enterprise should prior constituencies, not just consumers, recognizing that impact extends beyond buyers and sellers of goods and services. Social enterprise really does have the ability to be very exciting and very successful, doing well by doing good. In order to endure as a concept, social enterprises need to prove they can be profitable and that professionals, including many of you here in the audience, can make a fulfilling career in this sector. Social enterprise should focus on sustainability along commercial and environmental dimensions. We should think that the environment, social, and political impacts of social enterprise should be analyzed alongside balance sheets and quarterly reports. In other words, we should be constantly asking, how are you treating the people and the environment you're working in? But we wonder, in addition, how does social enterprise define profit and benefit? How do we measure impact and use it to improve our business model? And how do we balance profit with purpose sustainable? Thirdly, as a leadership team, we believe that social enterprise should disrupt injustice and enlarge opportunities. In its hiring practices, production processes, and marketing strategy, social entrepreneurs should design business practices to benefit people. But once again, we have many questions to ask. Firstly, how can social enterprise solve problems that were themselves created by others? Can social enterprise address the root cause of social problems? If so, how? Should social enterprise focus on big thinking or small thinking? Does the space have room for expansion along both scales? And should the field limit its focus to amplify impact? These are just some of the questions we are here to explore, and we hope that you can help share your thoughts and answers with us today. So one final important point. We believe that social entrepreneurs, such as ourselves, and all of you, should recognize the potential and limitations of our work. We know that, every social, we know that not every social problem will have a profitable solution. Rather than supplanting advocacy or government intervention, we believe that social entrepreneurs should partner with policymakers and industry leaders. We are stronger together. We also know that the journey towards social impact can be a lonely one. Social entrepreneurs, in forums like this though, have opportunities to connect with a larger group of people who are pursuing the same mission as themselves. That's what CECON is here for, to provide a larger sense of community and to help build a tribe. So we'd love to continue this conversation with you today and we hope that these are themes that you'll talk about in your panels and workshops Action Labs and Ivy Labs, the pitch for shame at the career fair. Uh, thanks very much for being here on a great evening Sunday morning, and we hope you have a great time. And at this time, I would like to introduce none other than Professor Cash Rogan, one of the founders of social enterprise here at HBS, one of the most well-respected, well-known names in this field, and one of my favorite professors here at this school, <coughs> Professor Cash Rogan. Good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning. It's, my, Good morning. it's my pleasure to invite you all uh, to the 15th Social Enterprise Conference. 
students get uh, how we carry school, we have a business school, students put together run this conference year after year. Uh, over the last two days, yesterday at the Kennedy School, today at the Business School, and as the rain dies down a little bit, I know that there will be more than a thousand of you delegates uh, attending the various sessions uh, put together by over a hundred speakers and panelists coming from all over the world. Uh, welcome, and I'm sure the weather will improve and you'll have a terrific time uh, the rest of the day. So let me just take a minute or two. I don't want to come between you and the terrific speaker that Ajana is sitting right there. And Amrita has given me literally two and a half minutes. She said, two and a half minutes, Professor Ryan, that's it. I'm no longer taking your words. You're not waiting me two and a half minutes and then uh, you will have to go. So let me take two and a half minutes to share with you an anecdote. Twenty years ago, we founded the Social Enterprise Initiative at the Harvard Business School. It seems like yesterday, but literally it was 20 years ago, in 1993. And then when we were born, we were a little baby. And the folks who supported us and brought us out into the world, our Alan and I, our deans at that time, our supporters, and so on, said, what shall we name the baby? So one of them said, call it the Center for Nonprofit Management. The other one, no, 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 nonprofit management is too negative in terms. So let's call it Center for Not-for-Profit Leadership. The third person said, no, 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 what we should really call it is uh, the, the Leadership Institute for Civil Society Organization. Then we raised their hands and said, wait a minute, I want to have a say in our name, I'm the baby. So we said we want to call ourselves the Social Enterprise Nation because it doesn't matter whether you're structured as a for profit or a non profit it doesn't matter what the purpose is, it could, be, it could be anything in terms of what the IRS and tax rules are, but the whole idea is to create social value. Business creates social value, as I have mentioned, corporate social responsibility, a lot of those things create social value, nonprofits create social value, government agencies create social value, so said we want to call ourselves a social enterprise initiative. And it was quite perfect because 20 years ago nobody called it social enterprise, they called it non profit, not for profit, and so on. And that word social enterprise has become the defining term for the whole sector as a well. whole. Five years later, after we were founded, a bunch of students walked into our office. Marvel was there sitting right here. And they said, We want to do something. We are inspired, we are motivated, you know, this thing can, 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 can create social value, we can be a force for good. What can we do? So we, the faculty and the admission staff said, look, you know, we are only five years old. We barely know how to walk. So you know what? Hold our hands and follow our footsteps. That's how CCON was born, the Social Enterprise Conference, run by students. That's how it was born. They held our hands and followed our footsteps for not more than two or three years. Because once they knew how to crawl and walk, they just charged ahead. Seacon just charged ahead. And right now, it's 15 years. We are celebrating our 20th anniversary, the Social Enterprise Initiative. Seacon is celebrating its 15th birthday, this strapping youngster of 15 years. Look what they've created. More than 1,000 delegates come to a conference like this every year, more than 100 terrific speakers. And the Seacon conference, put together by students, totally by the business school and Kennedy School students has been rated by the Forbes magazine as one of the top 12 conferences to attend for the ideas that come out, the engagement, the discussions. It's on the league, same league as the World Economic Forum and the Clinton Global Initiative. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank the student leaders of CECON. Terrific job. What you've done for 15 years. Congratulations. And I'm looking forward to your 18th year, not even your 20th, 25th year. Uh, to see what happens when you go to college and what kind of impact we all have on this world. Do better, do good, and have a great time. Thank you very much.
we are uh, sponsoring the tote bag that you have received and some of the snacks that you will enjoy today. That is why I am so excited and honored to introduce our next keynote speaker, Leila Jana. She is the founder and CEO of Samsource, is a non-profit social enterprise connecting people in living in poverty to micro work. Google, eBay, and LinkedIn are just a few of Samsource's customers. What's so amazing about Samsource is that in just under five years, he has helped close to 4,000 workers move out of the poverty line. The organization has received several awards, including Secretary's Innovation Award from Hillary Clinton. And in 2011, Leila co-founded Semaphore, the first crowdfunding site for medical treatments in developing countries. Leila is a young global leader at the World Economic Forum, uh, director of Care USA, and a recipient of Club de Madrid Young Leadership Award presented by President Clinton. And, 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 and we're, we're excited to welcome you back to, to Cambridge, um, having graduated from Harvard College a long time ago. Um, so please join me. Give Leila a warm welcome to the Seacom Conference. Thank you so much to the Seacom team and Professor Romney, and congratulations on 15 solid years. Um, and good morning to all of you. I was an undergrad here 10 years ago, and I can't remember a Sunday where I had a complete thought before 10 a.m. So thank you for being here this morning, and I promise I'll try my best to keep you entertained. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story and some of the ideas that led me to found Sama. Sama, let's start there. Sama means equal in Sanskrit, and it's an ancient Indian language. This word means beautiful, or it means, I'm sorry, same level, balanced with fair. It's a beautiful word, and it carries a very potent meaning. And it carries this meaning in over a dozen languages. Sama is at the root of what I hope to do in the world, to create a more level playing field for people who don't share equally in the benefits of human progress. Today I'll discuss three ventures in the Sama group, Sama Source, Sama USA, our domestic program, and Sama Hope, which each use technology and social business methods to address fundamental and we really believe fixable disparities. I was 17 when I first glimpsed the extent of some of these problems. I had convinced my high school guidance counselor to let me graduate early and volunteer in Ghana, where I found a game teaching blind kids English. And I was struck by the poverty, the disease, and the lack of basic infrastructure like running water and electricity, but nothing was as devastating as the dramatic waste in human potential that I saw every day. Thinking that no one in Ghana spoke good English, I had expected to enlighten my students to poetry and literature, creative writing, to Langston Hughes and Emily Dickinson, and the profound beauty of my mother tongue. And so I was shocked when on my first day, one of my students, a skinny 11-year-old named Femi Abbas, told me that his favorite book was the Nigerian writer Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. He heard about it on BBC Radio, and he found a rare copy in the school library. And yet Femi was desperately poor. His family lived on less than three dollars a day and he was blind from a preventable condition that would have been averted had he drawn a better ticket in life's birth lottery. Living in that village in Ghana, I realized that talent is equally distributed across the human family, but opportunity is not. I saw how arrogant I had been, and I learned what poverty really meant. When I used to hear statistics about the earnings of the poor, I thought they were out of context. Three dollars seems like nothing in Cambridge, but surely it buys a lot more in a place like Ghana. But what very few people understand, probably you all understand this, but what very few people get is that these numbers are already adjusted for buying power, which means that about 4 billion of our fellow human beings, more than half of humanity, scratch out an existence each day on less than what $3 would buy in an average American town in 2005. Let that sink in for a second. $3 to support a family in 2005 in the U.S. If you were Femi's mom, how would you survive on that? 
Would you spend it all on food for your family, or would you let one child go hungry so you could afford to pay school fees for bright and penny? How would you cope with the knowledge that your son's disability could have been averted if only if you had the money? This is a photo I took a few years ago in a mining town in North India, where thousands of men bake their living, hauling coal on their heads, bicycling it to town, and selling it for a profit of about $2 a day. It's hard to believe that the same civilization that ended the apartheid, mapped the human genome, and put man on the moon, forces a billion fellow humans into a low wage treasury. The greatest measure of technological and social progress isn't how many billionaires we create, but how we treat the billions of people at the bottom of the economic ladder. And the biggest barrier for these bottom millions, for people like Fendi's mother, is finding a way to earn a decent living. One third of the global labor force, 976 million people, work full time and yet earn less than $2 a day for their efforts. These are the rickshaw pullers, the vegetable cart owners, and the manual labors. And yet people still want to work. A recent book by the polling company Gavin's chairman reported that more than peace, security, food, and even love for sex, the majority of humans want one thing, and that's a good job. Work is at the core of human dignity. It's how we define ourselves and how we make a contribution in the world. And it's also the best way to end poverty. So many problems, from sex trafficking to infant mortality, are rooted fundamentally in poverty. A living wage allows people to improve their condition on their own terms, to learn new skills, to better themselves, and to contribute meaningfully to their communities. A living wage transforms lives. And I believe that one of the best ways to create living wages at the bottom of the pyramid is through the new digital economy. We live in a dazzling new era of big data. The digital universe is something to behold. 1.8 trillion gigabytes in 500 million files and more than double every two years. There are more bits of digital information than stars in the known universe. This presents a huge opportunity. The world of big data includes information like status updates, like contact information for businesses, and a mind-boggling number of records that are moving from analog to digital formats. Machines can make sense of some of this information on their own. But the thing is that we is that we need human judgments on a massive scale to find the signal in the voice. And what's remarkable is that we can now capture these human judgments with virtual supply chains, removing the constraint of physical infrastructure to create large numbers of jobs in poor places. The challenge with the traditional assembly line, the creator of millions of jobs in the last century, is that manufactured goods require expensive investment in good roads, in waterways, in reliable power systems. And most of this is not possible in the kinds of places where poor people live, in rural areas or in the slums of big cities. But what does exist in those places in great abundance is this. Brain power. We've made massive gains in education at the bottom of the pyramid. Global literacy in our lifetimes has skyrocketed. In Kenya today, 95% of people in poverty can read and write in English. And thanks to Moore's Law, the cost of the laptops and computers and infrastructure required for these newly literate people to get online is going down dramatically. We can forget about the $100 laptop. The Indian Education Ministry launched a $35 credit card size computer called the Raspberry Pi, launched in 2011 and sold out in two hours. It plugs into a TV and keyboard and costs just 25 bucks. These devices are connected in the most unlikely places. In case any of you are wondering, this is what the internet actually looks like. This is a photo that we took in Uganda last August, and it's a spool of fiber optic cable that stretches in one magnificent ribbon from Mombasa on the east coast of Kenya all the way up into the hinterlands of northern Uganda. This little cable has brought the cost of the internet down by up to 90% in areas of rural East Africa. All of these factors led me to an epiphany about six years ago when I met a young man in Kenya who would end up changing my life. Steve Luthay was my age, he was 25 at the time, and he ran an internet cafe in Nairobi, and he told me about the cities on the phone. <coughs> The Kenyan elections in 2007 had resulted in mass riots in the streets. I thought people were rioting because they were angry about the electoral process. Steve laughed. 
He said, these people are angry. They're working. Many of the youth who filled the streets and the images on the news were actually paid a dollar a day to riot. A dollar a day is all it costs to rent a human brain on the other side of the world. I saw in the alleys of those Kenyan slums countless kids just like Femi who were bright and deserving and better. I had just read Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat, and I thought, if outsourcing was generating billions for a few entrepreneurs in India and China, why couldn't we invert the model to generate a few dollars for billions of people in Africa? Why couldn't we convert internet cafes like Steve's into digital factories in every village and slum in the world, fueled by work from large corporations sitting on enormous budgets for data processing? And so armed with this dream and $10,000 in life savings, I quit my job. I should note I quit my job two months before my second year bonus, which I don't recommend. <laughs> Gave up my apartment in New York and launched a nonprofit social business called Sonosource uh, for my friends who in Alberta. And our mission is to give work to those who need it most using new tools, using the tools of the information age. We've invented a micro work model to transform this stream of data into jobs for some of the world's poorest people. Our homegrown technology, uh, built by our own engineers in San Francisco, breaks down big data projects from large companies into small tasks and trains poor women and youth to do these tasks from local computer centers just like Steve's. You can think of it as outsourcing 2.0, as both teaching a man, or better yet, a woman, to fish and ensuring that she doesn't live in a desert. That red cable stretching across Africa is more than just a way to get online. It's a digital river bringing a tide of work and income opportunities to people who've always been left out. Here's an example of one of those opportunities. A parking company came to us and said, we can't train our software to determine whether there's a car in each of these spots. So some source workers look at images on the other side of the world in real time and mark the spots with the cars in them. We do this for a number of major IKEA retailers across the US. This data then feeds an algorithm that trains computers to eventually recognize cars and images, part of the new and growing field in machine learning. Thanks to some source workers, sensors and prototype Volkswagens are now being trained to recognize pedestrians to reduce the number of auto fatalities around the world. The applications of microwork extend to every major company. Some source can mine sales leads from websites, transcribe uh, handwritten records in a country's national archives, or add metadata to a video repository. Because we work in some of the poorest places with marginalized people, we can afford to do the work that sits at the bottom of the outsourcing value chain and is increasingly common in this new era of big data. We started small with just one center in Kenya and 20 workers back in 2008 when we completed our first task. By 2011, we'd done half a million tasks and built a scalable work platform. And today, our system has processed 22 million pieces of micro work in nine countries. We've brought major technology enterprises into places like northern Uganda, which no one ever believed could be a source of talent for the world. And more uh, exciting to me than that is the social impact. Since we started five years ago, we've now moved, these numbers are a little out of date, we've now moved over 5,200 families, which includes over 20,000 people out of poverty. And that's double the number that was reported at this time last year. When I first met Steve, he had four people working for him. And now he's taken up the floor of his uh, office building and employed over 150. And we now have 16 Steves in centers around the world, from Port-au-Prince in Haiti to Blue in Northern Uganda. And we've shown that poor women and youth from some of the lowest income areas are capable of achieving their human potential for to provide through different work. What's most exciting to me about this transformation is that we've done it in partnership with some of the world's leading companies, including Google, eBay, and Walmart.com. These firms choose some source because of the quality of competitive pricing, not out of charity which means that we're able to put funds from corporate America to work for poverty alleviation using the power of the market in places where you never expect that to happen. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Northern Uganda. Three months ago, after about 20 hours of flying from SFO, I landed in Uganda's capital city, and I traveled with my team for 10 hours long, dusty roads and terrible highways, finally arriving at the beautiful 
where the cable that you saw earlier has finally landed. Northern Uganda still bears the scars of the two decades long civil war that saw tens of thousands of children abducted as child soldiers by Joseph Kony's infamous army. But now a different kind of war is unfolding the battle for good jobs against all odds. In this region, unemployment can be up to 80% among young people. Until recently, one of those people was Dennis. I met Dennis inside his thatched roof hut, which he built himself. He's industrious but poor. His main assets can be counted on two hands, five chickens, one goat, a few pieces of clothing, a cell phone really bought, and a hoe, which he's used to farm the land around his home and keep his family fed for a decade. Dennis suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. At age 11, when he was riding his bicycle home from school, he was abducted by a gang of soldiers into the Lord's Resistance Army. Dennis spent the next year in a living hell. He was forced to do things he can't bear to account. Through incredible force of will, Dennis escaped to a survivor's camp, and after many setbacks, at age 25, he graduated with a high school diploma. He was the first in his family to get past Carmel School. And then, like so many Ugandan youth, Dennis got stuck. He had no college degree, making him ineligible for any office jobs in the capital city. He got admitted to university, but he couldn't afford the school fees. There are no student loans. So Dennis decided to take matters into his own hands. He started making bricks to earn a living, selling them for a few cents apiece to others in his village. He pinched every penny, but he still couldn't afford his full tuition. It appeared that Dennis's fate was sealed. This bright young man with so much potential would become a brick maker, toiling for hours each day. And then came the internet. Just a five minute walk from Dennis's hut, a new kind of work is taking root. Dennis lives in one of a hundred villages scattered across northern Uganda that gets to experience the magic inside that red cable. Broadcast across a 300 mile radius uh, to shipping containers with solar panels on the roof. Inside, these panels power air conditioning and laptops for over a hundred people who now complete work for tech companies including Eventbrite, TripAdvisor, which is just down the road in Newton, Google, and Getty Images. Dennis started working with us a few months ago tagging celebrity photos for Getty, which runs the largest stock photo archive in the world. Imagine this the next time, although I know none of you read People Magazine or Us Weekly, but imagine this the next time you see one of those magazines in the airport. Dennis, uh, sitting inside one of those shipping containers, may have tagged that picture of Matthew McConaughey or Rihanna before it got into print. For Dennis, this container has become a lifeline, a well that allows him to tap into a mighty stream of work in the middle of what would otherwise be a job desert. He's learned valuable computer and job skills that enable him to compete in the 21st century. These experiments have brought hope to thousands of people as we've scaled across four countries. And this year, we decided that we couldn't ignore the tragedy that was unfolding in our own. My home state of California now has adjusted for cost of living, the highest poverty rate in the nation. 22% of our families live in poverty. One in six American families, or one in six Americans, rather, uh, lives in a family that earns less than $23,000 a year in household income. Across the country, our level of income inequality is higher today than it was in the 1920s. And I think digital work can help. Online work is somewhat similar to what we do. It's on the source, but it's more market-driven. It's a fast-growing, billion-dollar industry. Companies and individuals with digital needs can hire freelancers using work platforms like Otis, Elance, and TaskRabbit. These websites are somewhat like eBay, but where people exchange services. Over half a million businesses and two million contractors use these sites every day, and the two largest sites paid out $700 million to contractors last year alone. Compare this to traditional employers. This is a chart produced by the economist recently that shows that the biggest private employers in the world, Walmart and McDonald's, companies which have been around for nearly 50 years, uh, have, are roughly the same size as some of these online work marketplaces. So in March last year, we launched Sama USA, a pilot program <coughs> in three California communities that trains low-income community college students to earn extra income through these online work marketplaces. So we essentially teach people to be web-based freelancers and market themselves in the new economy. 
I had an idea a few years ago after a guy wrote a million comments on my blog. He said I was ruining America by outsourcing work to Africa. And his comment made me feel awful. I had just gone into debt to, uh, to pay my staff at Sama. And it felt like if I were ruining America, at least I should be getting rich doing that. Uh, so I was, I was really depressed when I, I Googled this man. Um, I Googled the location that he was writing from. And, uh, and found out that a big factory had closed their place from a small town in Ohio, and hundreds of people had lost their jobs. And I tried to put myself in his shoes and imagine some woman with a fancy education in San Francisco creating jobs for Africans, and it really hit home for me. So I wrote back on my blog, and I asked if this man had any ideas for a sound source model in the US. To my surprise, this person who'd been so bitter wrote back an incredibly kind note and said, I never thought anyone would listen to me or hear me. And we ended up inspiring what we think is a groundbreaking new program. There is a 70% dropout rate among community college students in America today. And the leading reason for that, for those dropouts, is lack of income. So we decided to pilot this model using lean startup methods. And uh, we decided to set a threshold of $1,200 per student in supplemental income. We figured. If we, can, if we can achieve earnings of the same amount that it costs to train each of these students, then we'll call it a success. We'll call it a positive return on investment. So uh, March represents our one-year anniversary of the pilot, and these are the results. We've actually seen uh, an over $1,800 income increase among students who've taken part in our 80-hour training. And though this doesn't sound like much to a lot of us, for a person who makes $11,000 a year, which is the average starting income of our student population, this is a 20% income increase, so pretty significant. So we're seeing this river of digital work lifting the incomes of some of the most marginalized people in my own state, and I believe this model could extend across America. I'm gonna tell you one story of uh, one of our workers who's been able to take advantage of this incredible new, uh, new type of work. And I want to highlight one other thing about this work, which is that it's uh, the starting wages in this category are so much higher than doing most other types of work that uh, we train for people to do in low-income communities. So the starting wages are much higher right off the bat than, uh, than the minimum wage. This is a woman that I met about a month ago. I took our whole team out to Merced in the Central Valley in California, which is our breadbasket, the breadbasket of America and also state that is desperately poor. The average tenure of unemployment in our class in Merced is four years. And Mary came to us in our first uh, program at age 69 with an incredible story. Mary had been a truck driver her whole life. She's a million miles, which means she's completed a million miles with no problems. <coughs> and she was very proud of never accepting a handout from anyone and getting herself through, uh, through life and putting her two kids through school without any help. And then she was diagnosed with cancer in her early 60s and spent a decade battling cancer and losing her and her husband's life. <coughs> so what was she to do at 69? She couldn't go back to truck driving. She had no other skills. And she was, uh, she was really desperate. She enrolled in our program, the oldest student by 40 years, and fearlessly <coughs> learned online work skills. A week after she finished her training, she was able to secure two different contract jobs paying about $20 an hour. And Mary came to our, uh, our off-site in, in tears and said that she never imagined that someone like her could learn these new tricks, as she called them, uh, doing all their work. This is the power of Sama. <coughs> Sama Source and Sama USA are the first steps in a broader vision. We're building a family of social enterprises, the Sama Group, that all use technology in new ways to address these fundamental injustices. The latest member of the group came out of a chance meeting I had in a small hospital in Sierra Leone in 2011. I traveled there on some source business and soon learned of another major problem that technology could fix, <coughs> in access to medical treatment. I was touring this hospital and uh, met this incredible man, Dr. Maggi, who was really out of place in the middle of Sierra Leone and told me he was there providing fistula surgeries. I knew nothing about the problem with fistula, which is a birth injury that can cause a woman to be incontinent if she uh, endures a prolonged labor or has complications. And I knew nothing about this problem uh, or the scale of it. And Dr. Maggi told me that several million women in Africa face this horrible condition 
and didn't have access to good medical treatment. He told me one of the most upsetting statistics I've ever heard, which is that in Sierra Leone today, one in 14 women die in childhood. It's one of the highest rates of maternal mortality in the world. And I couldn't believe standing there in the hospital in 2011 that they allowed us to have it. Dr. Naji inspired me to dig deeper into this problem. And he helped me understand that the bottom third of humanity receives only 3% of all surgeries, which means that millions of people suffer from preventable blindness, treatable birth injuries like fistula, burns, and trauma. I learned that more women suffer from severe burns than from HIV and TB combined. So I had a crazy idea sitting in the hospital. Why not create a crowdfunding platform like Kickstarter or Kiva, but for surgeries? What if we could tell the stories of Dr. Grant's patients, put them up online, and ask people for a five or ten or twenty dollar contribution? Who wouldn't give that money right away if they saw this need? So I teamed up with two co-founders, and six months later, we launched a website called Sambo. This was the first prototype. We started with a very basic crowdfunding model. We posted profiles of patients and matched them simply to donors. But this model was challenging. For one, we had to put the details of these women's medical conditions online, and we felt like it was undignified. I felt like if I had a question, I certainly wouldn't want to explain the details of that to, uh, to the entire internet. And so we, we thought about ways that we could address this challenge. And while we were mulling over the problems on our initial website, we launched a social media campaign called Honor Your Mom, and we're about to do it this year again for Mother's Day. Uh, this campaign allowed people to buy their mom a donation instead of flowers or candles. So you would donate in the name of a woman who needed a surgery and upload a picture of you and your mom from back in the day. And we created a beautiful uh, social media campaign around it and had celebrities tweet it out. Uh, so this, this campaign was really exciting. We also were able to send the mother's cards in the mail, so moms loved this program. We decided, after running this program and getting more data, to do a pivot. And we pivoted to focus on the doctor experience rather than the patient experience. We figured out a way to get around that problem of having to tell the story of the patient. So now if you go on some of them, you can see this, this problem through the lens of very experienced doctors, doctors like Dr. Maggi. We post the doctor profiles, we post videos of the doctors, and we allow you to fund treatments through those uh, medical professionals. To date, we funded several hundred critical treatments, though the site is very small, it's a scumbox project with just three people working on it. Mm -hmm. And we've extended the benefits of this life-saving surgical care to people who would never normally be able to afford it. And more excitingly, we've, we've been able to connect people to what we believe is a huge issue in global health. Dr. Farmer calls this the neglected stepchild of global health. One of those people, my last story, is a woman named Tiange. I met Tiange when I visited uh, Dr. Maggi for the second time, and she was 16 when I met her, a bright and beautiful girl who excelled in English, and I was told that she was one of the top students in her English class before she had dropped out. At 12, Tiange was raped by her teacher, and uh, became pregnant and forced to drop out of school. Luckily, her parents were supportive, and they took her in and tried to capture the teacher who fled. And then Tiange, after a four-day labor, with no painkillers in the middle of a hut, in the middle of Sierra Leone, she developed a fistula. And that fistula prevented her from continuing the school after the pregnancy. So she was forced to drop out for four years. Luckily, her uncle heard about this crazy Western doctor who was doing surgeries for women like Tiangre and managed to get on the bus and get her to Dr. Mitchell's center. Months later, Tiangre received a surgery with support from some of the funds, and now she's back in school. And that's the power of the internet. That's the power of this kind of connection. These Sama ventures are still young, and the problems that we've chosen to tackle seem enormous and often intractable. But when things get tough and I feel defeated, I go back to the memory of my first days in Africa 13 years ago and to the relentless optimism of my young student of me. And I remember the funnies of the world and the Dennis's and the Mary's and the Tiangays, and how they maintain hope, even in the worst circumstances. The least we can do for them is to follow along in their optimism, to decide to tackle poverty with the same level of urgency and innovation we apply to creating the electric car or connecting and bringing people to a social network. 
Technology and business can be fantastic levelers, but we have to wield them well. We must make a commitment to deploy technology as a powerful force, not just for social networks, but also for social justice. To apply our collective business brain power to the world's messiest problems, which rarely surface in these beautiful conference centers or office buildings. And to call upon our community to put technology to its highest and best use, which is as an engine of human empathy. Thank you so much.
the new opportunities, which are about reviewing the output of computer algorithms. Right? So now we can do most transcription automatically and automated in an automated way. Um, but we still need humans to tag things or to add some subject and input on top of that. And I don't think that kind of work is going to go away until the singularity happens and you know, who knows if we should be right or as well. The second uh, point about outsourcing is, uh, is also a really interesting one. In, um, I, we were kind of conflicted. We work with Walmart, and uh, we work with some big e-commerce retailers uh, who were part of the Bangladesh uh, factory. Isn't it? And my belief is that by influencing companies to see their workers on a level playing field, which is what we do by connecting them so directly to these workers, we start to change those behaviors from within. And I think the only kind of lasting change is behavior change that starts from some kind moral uh, you know, belief system. And I, I think we saw it at the end of apartheid when companies voluntarily stopped doing business with the apartheid regime. I think uh, similarly, we're, we're sort of paving the way for companies to think about labor and development countries very differently. And Solid Source does that inherently because workers are connected directly to the internet to employers and clients. And our customers can log into our website and see which workers are working on their projects and from where. And that does a lot to humanize people on the other side. So I think there's absolutely so much opportunity for uh, companies to use technology to facilitate better connections. And I think so many of the uses that we've seen are often not as uh, intentional as we might think they are. So the people who are commissioning these products in the West are often not aware of who's doing the work. You know, the subcontractor or the subcontractor and all of us is doing the work. So the more we can facilitate those direct connections, the less of a chance there will be for this kind of stuff to happen. I should say I have about 10 more minutes before I have to run and catch a flight. Um, but if you, if you have questions and you can't get to them, please do email me. Hi, Leila. Thanks for coming. My name is Leila, and I just spent a couple months visiting social entrepreneurs in Southeast Asia, many of whom are trying to employ the form of job opportunities. And, and I saw that many of the people who had gone through these programs had an awesome desire and capacity to learn more after the days of months that they acquired. And I wonder if at some source you have a plan for what's next for after people learn how to tag and then have the ability to learn more. Is there a plan to have more job development um, and potentially more economic opportunities? Well, the field of online work is, uh, is just growing really dramatically right now. Um, at least 30% cater, uh, but I think it's probably a lot more than that. So one area of opportunity for all of our workers is to graduate into these online work platforms and be able to sustain themselves as online entrepreneurs. And in fact, we've seen that one of my favorite stories is that one of our early data entry workers at Steve's Internet Cafe was a amazing woman from the slum in Nairobi. Ended up after working for about a year with Steve, uh, she heard about ODES and she set up a content writing business on ODES. So she writes content for the website. And she now has four people, four other women, from her slum to work with her. So that's a, a great example of the potential of people in the way for our careers. We see a lot of people, 90% of our workers actually move up to higher paid work or out to higher education. And uh, a lot of those workers are, are moving naturally into the form of the Hi, thank you so much for your time. My name is Harmony and I'm a fellow of the So we're very, uh, I'd say, light by our commercials. As we scale, it will be nice 